Okay, it's Wednesday afternoon, March 31st. It's our Bible class, and we are on a new subject today. We are studying the mysterious meaning of the red heifer. Now, some of you have heard things about the red heifer, and you're anxious for the up-to-date report, but I want to bring you through the red heifer before I bring you to that up-to-date report. Um, we have just come through the beginning of Passover, Pesach, Pesach, and it continues through Sunday night sundown, Sunday also being Resurrection Day on the calendar of those who are believers in Yeshua, Jesus as Messiah and Savior. So we have a lot happening right now. When did the Jewish people study recently about the red heifer? It was between Purim and Passover. So in that time, there's a Shabbat. It's a special Shabbat. It's actually the one right after Purim. So in the early part of this month of March, they studied the, the Shabbat Parah, which is the Sabbath of the cow. How's that for a, an interesting name? But it is a very interesting study. It's a study that confuses our rabbis. They are in a quandary. They consider this a paradox. They do not have the answer to the question, and that's why I called it the mysterious meaning of the red heifer. The red heifer, if you don't know, is a cow. Heifer is a cow. It's a female cow. And this sacrifice, because the red heifer is a sacrifice, interestingly enough, it, be, it causes the one that, who is doing it in that position, that, that priestly position, to become impure while the one that's being sprinkled on becomes pure, and yet the one who started it was pure before they became unclean. They can't figure this out. They, they don't understand it. They're not used to a female being a sacrifice. And the cow is also more unusual. Sheep and goats and bulls we know, but a female cow is very unusual. Our rabbis will say even Shlomo, even Solomon, who was the wisest of us all, and he figured out all the commandments and what they meant, except this one. And this one they consider, and they use the word chok. It looks like C-H-O-K in our English, but what that means is it's a statute, it's a commandment, you do it, whether it makes sense to you or not, that's not your problem. You leave that with God and you be obedient and keep his commandments. So this is a very um, important sacrifice that is to happen. And we'll see for whom and for why and get into the importance of all of that. But uh, we don't, if we can't understand, we don't get to ignore is the bottom line. So... What is so confusing about this? Well, first of all, it's the ashes from the red heifer that are used. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, it's going to be used to cleanse a person from the most serious form of contamination. It's going to be used to, to cleanse a person who's been in contact with death and also is uh, for those who have been lepers and are uh, coming clean, are supposed to be clean. Having to do with death, those who have been in touch with death, they know that death is a picture also of sin. We know that too. From Romans 6 to 23, we know the wages of sin is death. So we see that the two are tied in, that we're talking about spiritual contamination that causes physical death. And again, why does this perplex them? Because the one who was unclean is going to become clean at the cost of the one who is doing it, moving from being clean to becoming unclean. They cannot make sense because outside of one answer and one answer only, there is nothing that does make sense. Because you all know that I'm a Jewish believer in Messiah Yeshua Jesus, I'm going to tip my hand right now and tell you, when you open yourself up to that belief, you will see that this is a picture of, of Yeshua. You will see it's a picture of the Messiah. Every bit as much as we see him in the Passover, in Pesach, in the, the symbols that, that we do over and over and over, telling the story of our coming Messiah, we're going to see that, that the fulfillment of this symbolism, of, in, and in the Hebrew is para aduma. That means the red heifer. Um, Adama, Adam, red comes from that, and para is heifer. So when I use the Hebrew, you know what I'm saying, that we will see that it is a perfect picture of our Messiah, and it's the only explanation that makes sense at all. 
So let me go into what the red heifer is, what it meant, and why I can say what I have just said. Most of the uh, reference in scripture to the red heifer comes in the book Bud Midbar, that's the book called Numbers, chapter 19, verses 1 through 22. And this is recited in the Torah service that, that I just mentioned on that Shabbat. They will read through this. Why do they read it between Purim and Pesach? Because Pesach, Passover, is a start, is the beginning of the biblical new year. And they are to be preparing themselves for this coming year. They need to be as pure and right before God as they can. Because for this this uh, coming festival, this time of Pesach, of Pesach, of Passover, back in biblical times when the temple was standing, the Jewish people who were, I don't want to say religious, but who were keeping the commandments of God, had to make the pilgrimage up to Yerushalayim. They had to go to the temple for this ceremony, for Pesach. And so they need to be thinking about getting themselves right spiritually before God so that they are ready to, to go into his presence. So with all of that in mind, they read this portion of scripture and they talk about this. So let me tell you what the red heifer had to be like. It had to be as close to a perfect specimen as possible. It had to be completely red. It has to be without blemish. That means there's no defects of any kind. And the rabbis have decided that that without blemish is referring to its color. So that even if there are two white hairs or two black hairs found on the body of this red heifer, it is not declared kosher enough, pure enough to be the red heifer used in sacrifice. Just two hairs can disqualify. That's terrible. That's trying to be so accurate so right and and <laughs> what comes to mind is they're splitting hairs sorry no pun intended <laughs> is what was brought to mind okay that th this is the only sacrifice in the torah though where the color of the sacrifice is explicitly required so maybe they're on to something maybe god has a purpose in this and we'll keep talking about it and see what kind of conclusions we come to this animal, this red heifer, is rare, is very unique, a, a unique one of its kind. Maimonides is one of the most revered rabbinical sages of all time. He codified a lot of what Judaism is today, how to act it out, because you have to go from commandments in biblical times when there were the, the amenities that we have today, like electricity, etc. How do you apply what the scripture says? A, a quick, easy example is when the scripture says you're not to kindle the fire on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. Does that mean that we can't use our gas ovens because they have fire? Does it mean that we can't use an electrical light because there's a spark, there's a pulse there that comes through like a fire? They, they had to get together and decide what is the meaning, how do they carry it out? Because this is critical. If they're disobedient to any of the commandments of God, then they're not right before God, and they are in the place of receiving judgment. So it's not something to be taken lightly. And Maimonides, being so revered and so respected, he wrote, and he was 11th century um, out of the area of Spain. He wrote that the para ademot, that's just putting it in plural, the red heifers were prepared from the time of the commandment that was given from the destruction of the second temple. So he's taking it from the time of uh, 70 AD. He's, he's taking it from there. And he said, before that, Moshe, Moses, our teacher, prepared one red heifer. Ezra prepared one red heifer. And that's our Ezra that we read about who was involved in the, the uh, renewing of the temple in the days after they came back from the Babylonian captivity. He was down from Daniel's time, Daniel's time. Seven more were prepared between Ezra and 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. So we have a total of nine. We have uh, Moshe's, Ezra's, and seven more through that time coming down to the destruction of the temple. Now, remember this is Maimonides who has steeped himself in Judaism. He says, 
the tenth will be prepared by the Mashiach, by the Messiah. So they're waiting for the Messiah to come to prepare the tenth. Now we who believe Messiah came once see Messiah absolutely involved in the preparation, but even in more than that. Blessed be he. Now, not only does it have to be the right color, it has to have no blemish, but it also has to have never had a yoke put upon it. So that means it's never been used in anything that could be considered profane when it's put into the service of a holy God. It also had to be uh, in, in its uh, prime. Um, there's a word I'm fighting for when it comes to my mind. I'll bring it out. But usually they say between two and four years of age. This has to be when it's very fertile. Prior to two years, it's not considered fertile. It won't be old enough to be reproducing and to bring life, but it also cannot have been aged. Okay, I'll explain why these things are important in our belief of how it draws a picture for us as we move on. But right now, let me tell you also another critical point to the red heifer is this is what is the only sacrifice where all of the rituals revolving with this sacrifice were carried on outside the camp. Not inside, not at the tabernacle, not at the temple, not at the brazen altar, and not right there to carry the blood into the Holy of Holies area. Everything, even the, the blood that is applied, we're going to see is all done outside the camp, later outside the temple precinct. Uh, the sacrifice was uh, said to occur in a location, sorry, from the altar, okay? What I'm going to draw to you is they're going to be in a place where they can look down and see where the temple is, see where the tabernacle was, see where the offering normally is taking place, but they're opposite of it on uh, the Mount of Olives, opposite from the Temple Mount, okay? Another stipulation of the red heifer it was the only sacrifice that ritually contaminated the priest who offered it, but made the one sprinkled by it come clean. I did kind of explain that a few moments ago, but now I'm putting it down in a way that you can write it down. It ritually contaminates the priest, but the one that gets sprinkled by it, it becomes clean. <clears throat> Another stipulation of this red heifer is the only sacrifice where the ashes were preserved and used. All the others, the ashes would be scooped up. Remember that it was burned inside the camp. It was burned at the, the altar the, that connected with the tabernacle of the temple. And the ashes would be scooped up after the sacrifice. And they would be carried outside the camp and disposed of outside the camp. But these ashes are preserved and they are used. Now, Jewish tradition says the sacrifice of the red heifer was to atone for the golden calf. I guess they're saying that's why it had to be a cow. But nowhere in scripture do we read that, that the Torah tells us that is the reason. Now, if that's not the reason, what is, what are the scriptures pointing to? What are we looking at? I've already told you that I believe this is to be a picture of Messiah. So let's see if that fits. Let's see if the Mashiach perfectly fits the fulfillment of this red heifer. One of the first points I brought out to you is it had to be completely without defect. That's a picture of being completely without sin. Okay? The lambs was the same way. If they were blemished, they couldn't use them. They couldn't get, take a weak lamb. They couldn't take a... A, a lamb that limped. It had to be a perfect specimen. With this red heifer, it had to be one that was completely perfect, free from defect, and I will spell it out, free from sin. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, God made this sinless man a sin offering on our behalf, so that in union with him we might fully share in God's righteousness. Okay, someone God made, he was a sinless man. Now, who from Adam, from Adam all the way forward can claim that? Nobody but the Messiah. Nobody but the Messiah. Pam got it, hit it right on the nail. 
And when we're in union with him, we can fully share in God's righteousness because we who believe know that Messiah puts his robe of righteousness on us. So 2 Corinthians 5.21 is making it very clear. What I read to you was a complete Jewish Bible. If I read it in the New American Standard, it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Remember how, and, and I'm, I'll come to this point again in another way, but remember how I said that the, the one who was making the sacrifice started out clean, moved into impurity so that the one that it is sprinkled on becomes clean. Well, <coughs> here is the one who starts out no sin, and he will become the sin offering. And we know that's what Messiah did. Let's see if Messiah's life continues to follow what is regarded as essential and necessary for the red heifer. We come to that next point that he had to be sacrificed outside the camp. He could not be sacrificed inside the camp. Well, let me read to you from the book of Hebrews, written to our Hebrew people by a good Jewish author, Hebrew author. We're going to run all the way over to chapter 13 and look at verses 11 through 13. And in the complete Jewish Bible, we read, For the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest, brings the blood of animals into the holiest place as a sin offering, but their bodies are burned outside the camp. So we know that now he's talking about that red heifer. The body of the red heifer is burned outside the camp, and the ashes are brought in. And remember, I told you they're going to be used, and we'll see that. Verse 12, so too Yeshua Jesus suffered death outside the gate, outside the city gate, outside the camp, in order to make people holy through his own blood. Okay, we have it spelled out. The blood of Messiah is what's going to make us holy, going to make us clean, and it had to, he had to suffer this death outside the camp. Therefore, verse 13, let us go out to him who's outside the camp and share in his disgrace. When he was crucified, it was, it was supposed to be because he deserved that death. We know he did not personally, but he took it on for ourselves. And so when we recognize that and are willing to go to the foot of the cross, so to speak, then we are sharing with, with his disgrace. Instead of saying, no, we don't want to see that, that's, that's ugly and that, that's horrible and, and this must be a terrible sin, we see the truth of the matter. So that he made himself sin for us. He did not do this for himself. Okay, um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, we said that already. We read that. And again, um, just to refresh your mind, that part of the verse, God made this sinless man a sin offering on our behalf. So he became the sin sacrifice. And when we're going to be sprinkled with the ashes, in essence, or actually the blood from him then is going to make us clean remember how that's the what the red heifer was to do it was to the the priest that was sprinkling the ashes and and all from the red heifer would become unclean and we've just said that he's the priest he's the high priest messiah yeshua jesus is so we're going to see that his sprinkling will make the one that is sprinkled on clean but to do that he had to become the sin offering I'm not saying he became sin. I don't think that's an accurate way to state it. But he took on him the sins of the world. First uh, Kepha, First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 says, According to the foreknowledge of Jehovah the Father, God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, sanctifying, setting apart by the Spirit, by the Ruach HaKodesh, to obey Yeshua Messiah, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. So when God the Father is working through his spirit to set you apart, it's through the obedience of the Son that you are sprinkled by his blood so that you can gain grace and peace. To the fullest measure, no limit, abundant. If that verse doesn't shout out everything that we know is ours, it's an amazing verse. But let me give it to you from another source also. Remember, we like to always back up and prove from more than one scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22 says, I quote, 
So brothers, we have confidence to use the way into the holiest place. How can we go into the Holy of Holies? We know who was allowed into the Holy of Holies. Anyone who got their act right, got all cleaned up, put on the right robe, and got to go in? No. No. Only, and I see Rowena mouthing it. She's a <laughs> mute, but she's right. Only the high priest. Only once a year would he go in, and he go in with the blood of bulls and goats. Hebrews is going to tell us this is better blood than the blood of bulls and goats. And so how do we have the confidence to go into the holiest place? Is opened by the blood of Yeshua. He inaugurated it for us as a new and a living way through the parochet, through the, the, the curtain, by means of his flesh. So by giving his flesh and by putting his blood there, the curtain has been pulled open so that we have access, entrance into the Holy of Holies. That's what this is saying. We also have a great Cohen, a great priest over God's household. Therefore, let us approach the holiest place with a sincere heart. We don't have to say we can't go into that Holy of Holies where the Shekinah glory of God lived, dwelt. Now we can go in with a full assurance in our heart that comes from trusting, comes from our faith with our hearts. And how, how has this happened? With our hearts sprinkled clean. Interesting words. We're going to talk about this. Sprinkling clean from a bad conscience and our bodies, and get this part, washed with pure water. So sprinkled clean and washed with pure water. We'll come back to, to explain this more fully as we move on. Hebrews 12 and verse 24, you're in, you're in chapter 10, move over to 12. Hebrews 12 verse 24 says, And to Yeshua, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Of Abel. Remember, he was innocently murdered by his brother, but this is saying Yeshua's blood is even greater than the innocent blood of Abel. Why? Because even though Abel was innocent in, in his murder, he was not free from, from sin himself, so his blood was not as good as this blood that Yeshua brings because he was sinless, because he was more pure than even Abel's. Abel's. And Revelation 1.5 tells us, this now is written by Yochanan John, so we've got Peter, I believe we've got Paul, because I believe he is the author to Hebrews, but if you want to argue it, that's for another time. <clears throat> now we're going to have Yochanan. We've got three giants in our spiritual faith that are all agreeing on the same thing. Yeshua, um, I'm sorry, Yochanan John said in Revelation 1.5, from Yeshua the Messiah, from Jesus the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Now, how was he firstborn from the dead? In his human flesh. He was the first one God raised from the dead in that resurrection power of life that he can freely give to others. He was raised, <coughs> excuse me, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the earth's kings. What title does Yeshua have? King of kings. Here it fits. To him, the one who loves us, who has freed us from our sins, how? At the cost of his blood. Okay? Now, we're seeing the sprinkling clean. We're seeing that the blood is doing its purpose, but we're also seeing that they, the, there's a washing with pure water. We've got to talk to that too. But let me take you to that red heifer who's shed its blood, given its all, been burned up entirely, and we have the ashes. The ashes of the red heifer are what are used to, um, <clears throat> to purify the, the high priest before he would go into the Holy of Holies with the sacrifice of blood for the, the nation, for including himself. Where do, where do we get this about the ashes? We get it in God's commandment. God commanded these things. Man didn't make this up. God made the commandments. Go with me back to those commandments. The Torah is the first five books of our uh, original covenant, what you call the Old Testament. But we say original so you don't think old and antiquated. Go to the book called Bamidbar again. That's Numbers. 
and go to chapter 19. And as I mentioned before, you can read more of the verses in chapter 19 on your own. It talks about the red heifer. But in verses 5 and 6, it tells us the heifer, this, this para adma, this red heifer, is to be burned to ashes, completely burned up until it's nothing but ashes before his eyes. And if you look in context, it's before the eyes of the priest. Its skin, its meat, its blood, and its dung is to be burned to ashes. Every bit of it, 100% the whole, I can't say the whole enchilada, the whole cow, <laughs> the whole heifer, everything has to be burned up. The Kohen, the priest, is to take cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet yarn, and throw them onto the heifer as it's being burned up. Now this is unusual. This is different than all the other sacrifices and the way it's being done. Where it's being done, how it's being done in its totality, and now what's being added in with it. Yes, Lord. What Lord. Did you say the last one? Numbers, chapter 19, and I just read verses 5 and 6, and now I'm going to read 17 and 18. Why is this having to be done? Why has God declared this? Verse 17, for the unclean person, they are to take some of the ashes of the animal burned up as a purification from sin and add them to fresh water in a container. Remember, the bodies had to be washed with pure water. Now we're beginning to get into that. Verse 18, a clean person is to take a bunch of hyssop leaves, dip it in the water, sprinkle it on the tent or the tabernacle, on the, all the containers, on the people who were there, anybody who's been around in this this ceremony and on the person who touched the bone or the person killed or the one who died naturally or the grave so in other words no matter how that death came about whether it was accidental death whether it was uh, death just they got old and they died you know no matter what the reason of the death anybody who's been involved and touched this this dead person then they have to be cleaned and they have to be cleaned by taking the ashes of the red heifer mixing it with water and they are to take the hyssop leaves dip it in the water and then sprinkle it on the surroundings on the tent of the, the person that has died if they're doing it if they if they're involved with the tent on all the containers that, that would be anything and everything that that is being used and on the people who were there and especially on the person who touched came into contact with this um, deceased one Okay, now, if we're following this and we're saying, well, this is our Messiah, he's the red heifer, it's his ashes, it's his uh, that are mixed with water, his bloodshed that's going to make us clean, and all the rest of this should also be a picture for us that points to Messiah. So let's see if it does. Okay, especially because, remember, this is highly unusual. We don't read that this is done with any other sacrifice but we read it being done with the red heifer. So they put it on the dead people too? Uh, did it say on the dead person? The on, the dead people, on the people who were there, on the person who touched the bone, or, or the person who was killed, or the one who died naturally, or the grave. So I imagine by this point the person who died was the berry that they'll sprinkle on the grave. You know, they're just sprinkling everything that's been touched with it. it, it the idea is everything's been contaminated. And we know that when you get around sin, sin contaminates. You know, this is this is the picture that we're getting. This is where Ash Wednesday came from? Where you went to the church and you had well they still do, you have ash on the forehead? I would need to research what the history of that is. I don't remember where it came from, but it, it's a very good question. If you didn't hear it, I was just asked, is this where Ash Wednesday comes from, where they put the ashes on the forehead in the form of the cross? for 40 days of Lent, the time when they're getting right and getting ready for Easter or Resurrection Day, however you're calling it. Um, very good question, and it does make me wonder. Very good question. We'll have to come back with an well, answer on that. Maria? Maria, go for... Maria may have our answer. Oh. No? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. a lot of people do that. Um, can you unmute? Yeah, no, she can't. She can't unmute herself. No, she can't. Try now, Maria. Roger just did something. Okay. Well, you know, first of all, what the uh, what they do in in for the um, the ashes that they use 
to put the cross. Are not a red heifer today. I know that. No, no, but not even that. It, what they do is they they burn the saints. You know the uh, idols, you may say. Oh, okay. Okay. They burn those idols, and and the ashes of those idols is the one that they put on people. Okay. Okay. So it's it's not even the representation of of. <laughs> Okay. None okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate because you have that background that I don't have, so I appreciate mm -hmm. you bringing that um, to light. Rowena, go ahead. I know, what I know is when it's Palm Sundays, the people would be like waving palm, palm leaves, and then they leave that in the church building, and then the priest will burn the palm mm -hmm. branches to be used for the following year's ash. Wednesday. Okay, so either from idols and with some, and from the palm branches for others. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So God, Interesting. Uh, God doesn't allow idols for us to worship. Why would you burn them and sprinkle it on us when it's an idol? Because they don't see their representations that of the saints that they are worshiping in all honesty they don't see it as an idol but anything that receives worship other than god is an idol mm -hmm. whether it's a statue whether it's <clears throat> yeah um and really uh, medina just gave me to ash wednesday derives its name from the placing of repentance ashes on the foreheads of the participants either the words repent and believe in the gospel or to the dictum remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return so it's reminding them. I can see that very much of um, death, you know, that, that and that they're needing, needing repentance, they're needing, needing forgiveness, but that they did not drop from the red heifer. So thank you all three of you for it, the input. But uh, we know that there is nothing that, that is worthy of worship except our very God himself who, does, who says make no graven image, you know, and do not bow down to any graven image. But... They do not recognize it as such, even though that is what it is. And we can see also anything we put in um, the position of getting our attention and meaning more to us than our time with our God is an idol for us. It's in the way for us, even though it may not be something tangible. It could be our job. It could be, you know, to make money. It, it could be people. It can be anything. So, um, you know, it's just what they are using without seeing that as something that's not right. Because I can't, I really can't see if God's against idols. You know, why would you put it back on the Why people? do they have the idols in the first place if yeah. they understand that God is against them? Yeah. And, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I wanted to ask, even though a red heifer itself is so unusual and so rare. And we'll uh, talk to that, yes. <laughs> Is this, uh, is this part of the Torah brought up every, <clears throat> in that period between Purim and Passover, every year? And is it in Orthodox only, or uh, is it in, would you, would you say that most of the Jewish people ha are uh, very keenly aware of this, Any or just those who are in... The Orthodox frame of mind are uh, Hasidic. Any who are reading the portion of scripture that they're supposed to read every Shabbat after Purim, they will read about the red heifer. The only ones that I know that are concerned with needing a red heifer and needing to be in obedience to it would be those of the Orthodox persuasion who are trying to keep the commandments of God. So they're, they're, at this point in time, they're making substitutes because they don't have the temple. But all of this is going to be more meaningful when I bring it up today and who's looking for it and why today. Okay, but, okay. but anybody who's reading the portion of scripture, that is what it's on. Um, my experience is by the time you get down to Reform Judaism, they're barely reading those, those scriptures and... They'll look at it as an allegory or a story or, you know, this is why we, we don't, you know, we don't want anything to do with blood and sacrifice today, so we just discount it. But the Orthodox are very concerned. I, I'll tell you this much in case if you don't have the background um, or the knowledge, not background, but I mean the knowledge to know, those who are of that Orthodox persuasion, those who are trying to rebuild the temple, 
and I'll explain all of that when we get there, they are very concerned about finding a red heifer. They are actively pursuing finding a red heifer. So for them, yes, this is very critical. And you'll see why it's so critical as we move on. You know, I'll bring out I, where they are and, and why it's so important to them today. Okay? I wonder, too, I wonder too, I have a picture of one. Would you like for me to show you? I don't know how many can see, but yes, if you want to put it in front of your camera, that's fine. But it really just looks like a red cow. <laughs> yeah, yes. It yes. Okay. Yes. It all if you can good. see hers, I don't know. Some of you are on thumbnails. Some of you are on bigger. But if you can see it, and Roger's trying to enhance it right now for people. But uh, it, any, there you go. There you go. Very good. Okay. They go to, um, yeah. And view. actually, I know the site you went to, Ann. <laughs> Tell them, tell them to go to Speaker View and they'll be able to see it. Go to Speaker, speaker View. View and Top you can right. see it. And if you Top want to hold it back up again for a moment, on your your oh, your devices, it. yeah, you can well, Google it. It's all over. You know, a red heifer is not unknown. It's a it's a red cow. You know, yeah. it's <laughs> just you can't find a pure red cow today. I've seen a few in North Korea years ago, but. But they weren't 100% pure you know, because I guarantee you, had they, they been, Isra would have had a hold of it. <laughs> oh, you put it down now, Anne, before you're on breaks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I will ask you, am I mistaken uh, having heard that they have one now, that, but they're not declaring it yeah, because two. they're waiting two full years? And I'll explain what, and if that's right or wrong, I'll bring all that up to date once we get through going through the yeah, picture. I'm, rather than jump into 2021, I'm holding us to setting the standard, okay? And who the standard is, but I will answer that, so stay tuned. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, you're doing a good job when everyone is so anxious for practicing <laughs> something ahead of you here. I love it. When my students are running ahead on the, the topic, yes, I love it. I love the enthusiasm. And, uh, and, and we'll answer the question, why are people excited about it today? So, But we'll, let's stay on topic for right now. We're talking about the hyssop, the scarlet yarn, the cedar the stick that is thrown onto this burning sacrifice. That's unusual. They're throwing things onto the sacrifice for it to be burned up with them. Now, it just so happens those are the same items that are used to clean the, the leprous person, the one who has been diseased. These are the implements that had to be used in their cleansing also. And if you have a complete Jewish Bible and you see the word zarat, that is a word that we use for leprosy today. <laughs> so if it's saying it's to cleanse them from zarat, is to cleanse them from leprosy. Okay, the blood of this red heifer was assimilated into those ashes of the sacrifice. So we do not have separate blood that is held like we know when they sacrifice the lambs for Pesach and they put the blood on the doorpost, we know that the blood was drained from the animal. This time the blood, remember the scripture said it was to be burned up with the animal that, so that it's, it becomes a part of those ashes. Now those ashes are going to be gathered up. Remember, they're not discarded. They're gathered up and they are mixed with blood. No, because the blood's burned up. Oh. It's in the ashes. So what did we say makes them pure? The blood and yeah. the pure water. Water, water. Okay. okay? So we have what's now called water of separation. It's separating them. It's going to separate them, in essence, into a pureness. But when you keep in mind that there's this w pure water that, that cleanses, then verses like Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 13 and verse 1, will make more sense to you. This is talking future. This is talking when the millennium will begin. But it says, when that day comes, a spring or a fountain will be opened up for the house of David, and the people living in Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. The fountain of water, the spring that's springing up to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Impurity is uncleanness. It's um, ceremonially impure. It's needing to be set apart to be purified by the waters of separation. That purification would take seven days. They would use hyssop, the sticks of hyssop, and remember, maybe I should bring out right now. Yeah, let me bring out what hyssop is. I'll tell you what they do with it, and then I'll, I'll explain what hyssop is. 
it's they they would use stalks of hyssop, dip it into the water, and then shake it shake it ritually over the defiled person, the one who's who's now going to be declared clean from leprosy or from touching a dead body. They were to sprinkle the, this water on them on the third day and the seventh day. After that second sprinkling, the person would undergo a purification process where they would be immersed in a mikvah. That's a <clears throat> It's a, a container of water, and it was specific. It had to have certain steps going down and steps coming up, and the person would go down into the water and come out the other side. It's, in essence, it begins to give us the picture of our baptismal tanks, where you go down in the water, dead to your sins, come up in the newness of life, pure now. It is beginning to be a picture of where they draw baptism from. Once that person has been sprinkled the third day, sprinkled the seventh day, gone through this uh, ceremony where they were immersed, and that means water up over their head in the mikvah, then they are still declared unclean until the following evening. Then remember at the evening, the new day starts, and that's when they will be declared clean. Now, let's look at hyssop, because we want to understand the meaning of why, you know, why, why these things, what is being brought out. If you were with me in uh, Pesach, you heard about hyssop very recently, but for any who were not, let me tell you that through scripture, hyssop is always used with clean water and is always used for a cleansing when we read it in scripture. The first time I think that we do see it mentioned is in the book of Shemot, in the book of Exodus chapter 12 and verse 22, which just happens to be this, the chapter that tells us how they were to... Uh, prepare their home for that first night when the death angel would pass over. The blood of the lamb was to be put on the doorposts. It was to be put on with hyssop. So they'd have that basin that had the blood in it. They would dip the hyssop and they would put it on the doorposts. And we know that we saw in the dipping, we saw, I mean in the placing, the water up on top, the water, sorry folks, the blood would drop and when we do it on the sides, we see the form of the cross, but we also see, because we want to use our Jewish minds, we see when it's being painted, and it would have been so that the death angel would see, we see the letter Chet that is being painted in that picture. Chet, in, in um, its etymology and the root of the word, it stands for sin, but we also have come out of Chet, the word Chai, which is life. So where sin brings death, there is a door that brings life. When the blood is applied to the doorposts of the heart, we move from sin into new life. And Chet just happens to be the eighth letter in our Hebrew alphabet, which is the alphabet, which makes the number eight stand for, well, it doesn't make it, but it happens that the number eight in Scripture stands for new beginning. So we have that blood applied to the doorposts of the heart that bring us into a new beginning, a new life, where we are declared pure, we are declared clean, we have had the, um, the hyssop, the blood, and the water that has purified us. So all very interesting in a picture of this hyssop. Roger's showing you how the blood would be on the doorposts. If you can see, again, go to speaker view, I think, and you'll see it. If not, you can call it up on your devices later and see if you have not seen it before. Hyssop grows like a lowly shrub. There's nothing that makes this look like a beautiful shrubbery. Oh, I want to go plant that all around my house. No, it looks like dried up squig not squiggly, um, thin, little thin sticks is a lot what hyssop looks like. And they would take, now here's where it's got, it's, it's, this is when it's blooming. Yeah, when it's blooming. And there, and there is a little more of a beauty there, but when it dries up, what they're using it just look like twigs. They would tie several together, and then they would dip it in the blood and use it as their paintbrush or as their sprinkling tool, okay? Now, because it grows low to the ground and because it's not usually beautiful, even though these pictures are making it pretty, there is a short time when it has a beauty to it. Um, the one on the left begins to look a little more... You see a little less of the beauty there and a little more how it could be, you know, used to be painting with. 
Anyway, uh, my left, your right. Anyway, um, kind of looks like weeds. It rocks. looks a lot like weeds, and the idea is it's a symbol of humility or lowliness. Um, and again, it would be used for the sprinkling to clean, uh, cleanse someone who touched a dead body, or for a leper, according to Vayikra, Leviticus chapter fourteen. You can read that on your own, also. Now, when hyssop would be used, and Roger's showing you another means for it, but I hope he's not just sidetracking you. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. Hyssop in scripture is always used. There you go. There you go. Okay. There's a dried, dried up, and uh, and just you know, lowly compared to beautiful, blooming, gorgeous. Anyway, this this would be what would be used. Um, hyssop in scripture again is always dealing with washing, with cleansing, with saving, and with purifying. It always is pointing to salvation. In Tehillim, Psalm 51 7, the psalmist said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be white as snow. Is he getting it? The hyssop and the water, the blood and this this spring a fountain of new life. It's also interesting that the hyssop was aromatic. It did have a medicinal herb in it. That's why it was offered to Yeshua when he was on the cross mixed with vinegar. It, it would have been trying to, to take just a tad bit of the pain off. It took a lot of water, didn't it? Because it had to cover their heads. Like it, had to be deep. it had so to be deep. So they had to use a lot of water with a little blood. It was... It was, well, the blood's mixed into the ashes. The blood's not or in the water. It's mixed into the ashes. Okay? It's in the ashes. Yes. The or blood. In the water. No, it's not in the water. Down is water. Yeah, no, it's the blood and the water. The blood's mixed on the ashes, but they take those ashes and not, this is before the mikveh, they take water and the ashes, they mix it, the water separation, they dip the hyssop in that, and then they sprinkle the person with those ashes that that now is the mixture of blood and water in those ashes then that person goes into the mikvah and would come out cleansed and the blood too so all three is mixed yes blood ashes and water yes yes before they go into the mikvah okay um why did why did david say purge me with hyssop and that, that he'd be clean, wash me, I'll be white as snow. He's seeing the whole process there that we're saying. And when we see it on the doorposts, like at Pesach, we're seeing it there as a symbol of protection, a symbol of being delivered, because they were delivered from the blow of the death angel, but they had to be in belief. They had to be believing. And, um, um, and you know, so that can apply to them. Okay, let me give you also... Uh, Hebrews 9 verses 18 to 20. This says, When Moses, when Moshe had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, all that today our people say there are 613 commandments, he's given it all to them. Once he had given them all of the law, he took the blood of calves, that's cow, baby cow, young cow, together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll, sprinkled the word of God, sprinkled all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. So again, we see the symbolism being used, and uh, we see also, um, I think I've given it to you now. So when Yeshua is shedding his blood on the cross, when we see even the, the offering of the hyssop, of course, it's not to clean him, but we're seeing a, a blood that is going to purify from the defilement of sin. Okay? So this mixture, the water separation that his sacrifice created is the means that makes us clean from the impurity of sin. It's not, it's not just, what I'm trying to say is this is blood that makes us clean. That blood that we see from the ashes mixed with the water sprinkled on a person, and then they go through the ceremony to make them clean. We see and we read in Ephesians chapter 5, the end of verse 25 and end of verse 26, just as Messiah also loved the church, the called out assembly, the congregation, and he gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. He might set her apart unto God. He might declare her clean. How did he do that? Having cleansed her, by the washing of water with the word. 
So the washing of the water, along with the word of God, and we know Yeshua is the word, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. This is what brings us our purity. So do we not see, <laughs> at least so far, the ashes, the, the water, the hyssop, all being a picture of Messiah? It makes our red heifer make sense, sense, and we're not done yet. Hebrews, again, chapter 10, verse 22 says let us or therefore i'm sorry let us approach the holiest place with a sincere heart okay i'm going to stop you right there for a moment make sure you're on the same page what with the writer that? this is hebrews 10 22 when he says approach the holiest place where's the holiest place the holies of holies very good a plus it pam the holy of holies where the mercy seat was where the blood is applied by the, the high priest once a year for the forgiveness of sin for the entire nation. Okay, that place, the holiest place, we are told, approach it. Now, normally it would only be that high priest, but we can approach it with a sincere heart and the full assurance that comes from trusting or from having faith. How with our hearts sprinkled clean, from a bad conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Do you see it? The sprinkling and the washing. We see the ashes that are mixed with his blood being put on us and then we go through the, the ceremonial water because water purifies and they come out pure, they come out clean. We see this picture for us and through this we're allowed entrance into the holiest place. Well, the only thing that opens that holiest place is that pure, sinless blood. But we know when the high priest put the blood of bulls and goats, he had to do it again next year, and he had to do it the next year. And when that high priest died, another high priest had to step in and do it the next year and the next year. We see it continually. We're going to see the concern for the red heifer every year. But when we get to Yeshua, when we get to Messiah and his blood put on the altar, in Hebrews, it tells us it is once for all, that there is not going to be another high priest. He is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which has no beginning and no end. That's Mel Melchizedek. My God is king. He's also priest. He has stepped into that role, and his blood on that altar now purifies forever. That's how we can come in, because his sinless blood has been put there. So the God of Israel determined through his wisdom that the ashes of the red heifer is the secret to the restoration of the purity of the world. Now, does that sound like something that just came out of the scriptures? It could because it's right on target. But do you know that was said by a rabbi from the Temple Institute that is very concerned with rebuilding the third temple and having everything in order and ready to follow the commandments of God? Does he know what he himself just said? That the God of Israel gave way through the red heifer for the restoration of the purity of the world. If Messiah is that red heifer, if, he, if it's a picture of him, then this all fits. And what he's saying, I believe fully to be true. I just wish he really knew what he was saying. Now, building a holy temple, worshiping in that holy temple, is not permitted by God without the restoration of ceremonial purity. And that's only possible by the ashes of the red heifer. The high priest had to have himself sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer. Are you beginning to see why the red heifer is so important to the Orthodox Jew today? Are we beginning to answer Anne's question? <laughs> I think we're beginning to see a start, okay? And I already brought out to you the tradition that there were nine red heifers through all of our history. The appearance of the tenth heifer is associated with the advent of the Messianic era. That Messiah is the one that's going to be involved with this tenth red heifer. Very, very interesting. And nine that were completed prior to and they're waiting for Messiah for this tent. It's also interesting through our prophet, prophetically speaking, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, in chapter 36, verses 25 and 26, speaking for God says, Then I shall sprinkle pure waters upon you, 
and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will also give you a new heart and place within you a new spirit. Could God be referring here to the sprinkling of the pure waters? Could he be clicking off in their minds this ceremony with the red heifer that would cleanse them? And if so, cleansing them from all their idols, there's no way that this is having to do with the golden calf and and forgiveness from that. It would not the belong. The calf was evil. Exactly. Yeah, so why exactly. It was an idol. So, exactly. Exactly. It falls apart, and yet they cannot come up with any other explanation of why a cow, why red, why a heifer. <clears throat> well, we'll go on and we'll tell some more of those meanings in just a moment. Anne, you've got a question? What was that last reference? Something 25, verse 26? Uh, Ezekiel 36, <clears throat> verses 25 and 26. Okay, and I wanted to ask you really quick, um, has, uh, is there any place in this, uh, in considering that when Messiah's side was pierced, water came forth <laughs> from his side? Okay, my little A student who wants to run ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's fine, I, that's yeah. fine. Yes, I believe that, that, I know that that showed the broken heart, it showed the completeness of death, but I also believe that we are seeing a picture. And even more though, we're going to get into the waters being out of his belly would flow rivers of living water. We've already talked about the fountain that will spring up to, to cleanse in Zechariah. So even though we see a slight with the, the piercing, I believe the greater will see it just... The, the Word of God is called the water, the washing of the water of the Word of God for cleansing by Kepha, by Sha'ol Paul, by I think even, maybe not, but I think John even in, in some of his. So not in totality, but we can begin to see a picture. We can, and it was mixed with the blood, so we can begin to see a picture. Maria? Um, you said that it was Ezekiel 26? Ezekiel 36. I'm sorry? Ezekiel 36, 3, 6, verses 25 and 26. Oh, okay, okay. 26. Okay. And stay in okay. 36 for a moment because I want to also bring out to you, when our Jewish people read the Torah all year long, they start in Bereshit Genesis and they end in Davarim Deuteronomy, and then they start all over again. And it takes them a full year to do this cycle. Okay, and the last Shabbat where they end the end of Deuteronomy, they also begin the beginning of Genesis so that there's no break. It's like a, a circle that you can't find the beginning and end. Okay, they read that portion every year. They read those five books in order, in entirety. They start with Genesis chapter 1. They don't skip any chapters, and they read all the way through till they get to Deuteronomy. I don't remember the last chapter right now. Anyway, the end. Okay, now they also read a portion every week that's called the Hof Torah. That means it comes after the Torah. This is the prophetic books, this is the writings that, that you have also. And it's very interesting that when they're reading this about the red heifer on that Shabbat that follows Purim, Purim that they're also reading Hezekiel, Ezekiel 36. They're reading verses 16 to 38. I'm not going to read all of that, but I'm going to start in verse 16. This is what they're reading at the same time, and I'm reading it to you from the complete Jewish Bible. The word of Adonai, the word of the Lord, came to me. And it, it's to uh, Hezekiel. He's the one that's recording. He, he's been given a vision, I'll tell you that, um, in this area. Chapter 37, he sees the dry bones, <laughs> and he's asked, can they live again? And it's a picture of being um, dead because the Spirit of God is not in them. But it can, they can come back to life but when the Spirit of God comes in. But in verse um, chapter 36 and verse 17, Human being, or son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their manner of life and their actions. Okay, They lived in Israel. They did things that, that made themselves defiled. Their way before me was like the uncleanness of Nidah. Nidah is those waters that they need to separate for the clean cleansing. Okay? Therefore, I poured out my fury on them because of the blood that they had shed in the land 
and because they defiled it with their idols. The golden calf was before they even got into Israel, but once they got into the land of Israel, we know that they brought idolatry in. Bless Shlomo, our wisest king started out so wise and he ended up so foolish. He brought in a thousand women that were considered either his wives or his concubines, and a concubine is nothing but a sex slave, okay? So he had relations with all of these women. He was a playboy. There's no nice way to put it. And what did he do to appease these girls? Bring your gods in. You worship another god than ours? Bring it in. We'll make a little place for it. So the <clears throat> land of Israel was full of idolatry. Shame on him. How he could be so wise and so foolish, yeah. I do not get it. But he That's was crazy. and he did. And the land was filled with so much idolatry that when God continually called them out and they continued to ignore, he finally warned them this was one of the major reasons why they would go into captivity for 70 years. This and not keeping the Shabbat, not, not letting the land lie fallow when it was supposed to. So God said, okay, I'm going to give the land its rest that it's supposed to have. You missed it 70 times. I'm going to give it all at once, <coughs> 70 years, it, because it, it would lie fallow for a year. And it would be cleansed of idolatry and all of that, okay? But here he's saying, I poured out my fury because of their defilement with, with idols. Verse 19, I scattered them among the nations. That's the Jewish people, not the idols. <laughs> I scattered them among the nations, dispersed them throughout the countries. I judged them in keeping with their manner of life and actions. The judgment fit the crime. Verse 20, when they came to the nations, they, uh, when they came to the nations they were going to, they profaned my holy name. So the people said to them, these are Adonai's people who've been exiled from his land. The people around even realized that they were the people of God, but God kicked them out of their own land because of their idolatry. But he doesn't leave it there. Verse 21, I am concerned about my holy name which the house of Israel is profaning among the nations where they have gone. Therefore, tell the house of Israel that Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, says this, I'm not going to do this for your sake, house of Israel, but for the sake of my holy name. I'm not doing it because you deserve it. I'm doing it because of my name, which you've been profaning among the nations where you went. You've given me a bad name in front of them. As we say, you've given God a black eye by the way you've acted in disobedience to him. But in spite of that, because of my holy name, because of who I am and because I keep my covenant. Verse 23, I will set apart my great name to be regarded as holy since it's been profane in the nations. You profane it among them, the nations will know I am Adonai. So he's going to bring good out of this. The nations are going to have to realize when they see what God does with his people and the full picture, his name is going to be justified now. When before their eyes I am set apart through you to be regarded as holy. For I will take you from among the nations. I will gather you from all the countries. I will return you to your own soil. Hello. Do we see the beginning of that already? Israel back in the land is because God is faithful. Not because she deserved it. Israel's not back in the land worshiping the one true and living God and kicking out all idolatry. That's why we see chapter 37. There are dead bones in the land. Can they live? They need the Spirit of God in them. But in verse 25 now, key verse for what we've been teach, teaching on today. Then, when I brought them back in, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Could he be talking about the sprinkling of the red heifer ashes? Well, he's sprinkling them with his blood, with, his, with the water from the word, and he is the word that separates them and brings them to purity. This, again, the picture of the mikvah going in, having been sprinkled with the ashes, moving through the water that purifies, coming out into a newness of life, of cleanness. Yes, I believe this is the picture because verse 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit inside you. I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is also promised by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah. I will put my, chapter 31 if you want it later. I will put my spirit inside you and cause you to live by my laws. Respect my rulings. Obey me. Obey the laws. I'm sorry, obey them. You will live in the land I gave to your ancestors. You will be my people. 
I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. Okay? This is what God has promised to Israel. Is it fulfilled now? Well, let's look at the timing in verse 36. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, Adonai, have rebuilt the ruins, replanted what was abandoned. I, Adonai, have spoken it, and I will do it. Is that true today? Not no. yet. Do the nations around Israel know the one true and living God? No. They're full of idolatry. They're worshiping another God. They're not worshiping the one true and living God. And they're not seeing that God has brought his people back miraculously. And he is their God. And they are his people. And he's put a new heart in them so that they have worship of their God. What we're seeing is the promise of the millennial reign of Messiah on earth. When they had been purged coming through the tribulation and ready to enter into the, the millennial reign because they now have that heart for God. Remember, right at the end when Messiah is coming back, those who are uh, open to the scriptures, to the word of God, have the veil of blindness removed from the eyes, see him coming in the heavens. Matthew says that it can be seen from the east to the west, and they say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a time when Zechariah, Zechariah 12.10 says, they will look on me whom they have pierced, they'll mourn for me as one mourns for their only son. They will realize that, that God is saying, and God's speaking, and he says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of David and those in Jerusalem, my spirit. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. Here's your whole picture. And again, the piercing that we see was the death, the, the um, shedding of the blood for the forgiveness of sins done by Messiah. So I think all the way through is we're looking at the blood, we're looking at the water, we're looking at the hyssop, we're looking at all of this, and I've still got more to go. Not much, but a little bit. I think we're seeing a full picture of Messiah in his atoning, saving work. He is faithful. He promised, I'm not doing it on the basis of Israel deserving it. I'm not doing it on the basis of they're right with their God. I'm doing it on the basis because I keep my word. And as they see me, they will finally turn. And I can put that heart, that new heart in them and bring them into the, the cleanness of life. That this heifer, the ashes, the water, and the blood was to bring them to a newness of life. Remember, the leper would be declared clean. They could come back into the camp and live with the people. And the, the ones that, that, of course, were buried, they're gone, but, but the ones that were around them that were contaminated by the others would now be brought into that pureness. So on this deeper level, I think that we see very clearly Israel's national salvation, her return to the promised land after that great tribulation period, is linked to the sacrifice of the red heifer. I think that we see it despite the horrors of the diaspora, the, the worldwide um, uh, God sending out his people. What's the word I want? When he scatters them among the nations, their faithlessness is what brought that. But God is true to his promise, keeps his word, and finally when they, those who will accept Yeshua as their, their Savior, as their Messiah, they will be the ones that will enter into the millennial uh, land of Israel with Messiah on the throne. So, um, and it, again, um, I read to you, I already gave you um, Zechariah 12, 10. Also Romans eleven twenty six 26 says that, that in this, I'm sorry, and that it is in this way that all of Israel will <clears throat> be saved. When it's saying all, it's not, it's not saying the, the individuals. It's talking about the nation of Israel saved by the blood of the red heifer, the blood of the lamb, the one that pictured here as the Tanakh. As that original covenant says, out of Zion, out of Jerusalem, out of Zion is in Jerusalem, will come the Redeemer, and he will turn away ungodliness from Yaakov. Jacob being one of the, the fathers of um, of our Jewish people, one of the, the three forefathers respected. Well, that's Zechariah what? Zechariah 12.10 was that key verse that I read. Okay. And also Romans what? 11, 25, and 26. Thank you. Okay. Now, I brought you out this. Let me see if I've given you because I thought there was... Well, let me hit some of these high, low, high notes. High loads. Okay, let me hit a few of these just to clarify. You see that each one is a picture of Messiah. If he misses in one, it, then it's all over. The same way 
Remember that there are over 300 prophecies in the original covenant of Messiah in his first coming. And if any of those Yeshua Jesus did not fulfill, then he was not the Messiah and it's all over and he is not the coming one for his, the second time either. That just as he fulfilled every single prophecy, starting with, and, and I love this because of the impossibility of it, were it not God. How could Yeshua, who we believe is the Messiah, choose where he would be born? Okay, did anybody in their mother's tummy tell their mother, go to this city and, and have me born? I don't want to be born where you live. I want to be born in this city. <laughs> and you're laughing at because of the foolishness of this statement. But we take a pregnant Miriam who's living in Nazareth, North Israel, comes all the way down to Beit Lechem to the house of bread, to at the time that she's nine months pregnant. And we're not talking she got on a jet and she came down. It was easy. We're talking she's bumping along on a camel or a donkey or she's on her feet. That's nine right. months? Mm, wow. Right. And you know what? She makes it all the way down the track. She doesn't have to stop somewhere along the way. She doesn't stop in the Galilee area. She comes down further. She doesn't stop in the Judean mountains. She makes it all the way down to Beit Lechem before that pregnancy, that baby's coming on, and then that baby's coming whether they've got a place for, for them or not. So the ends are full. There's nowhere for them to go. Everyone's had to be there because of a declaration by a Gentile by Caesar Augustus, who said all the world's going to be taxed. You've got to go back to where your family came from so we can assess the taxing. And they, they want to put out a census also. In fact, it's more the census than the taxing. Forgive me. He wanted a census. He wanted to count the people. So they had to go back to where they came from originally. Miriam's family, Yosef's family, both came from the house of David, the house of David. They came from Beit Lechem. They had to go down there. And while they were there, the days were fulfilled that she should be delivered. And why could she not have a nice hotel room? Why couldn't that be a nice bed for Mama? Why did it have to be out with the animals? Why did it have to be where it's stinky and where it's dirty? And I'll get your question in just a minute. Why did it have to be in what today we would call a barn? Because... This one who was to be born in his human form, coming the first time, was coming lowly, was not coming as king of kings, even though that's who he is, was not coming to the palace to rule and reign where he deserved to be and had every right to be. He was coming first as a lamb, the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And are lambs born in hotels? Are they born in the palaces? <laughs> They're born in the farm. They're born in the stable. The, the Lamb of God was born in the stable to foreshadow right there that his life was going to follow every stipulation of the Messiah because that's who he was, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And he hits every prophecy that exacting all the way through that while he's on the cross dying in crucifixion, also foreshadowed 700 years before there's such a thing as crucifixion, they write in the scriptures that they will gamble for his robe. Do you know that robe was the only thing he owned, only thing of any value? And rather than tear it apart and each one get apart, they decided one should get the whole thing. So they gambled to see who would get it. You think he was directing that on the cross while he was dying, saying, uh, 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 no, you can't tear it, you have to gamble for it? But he fulfilled everything perfectly. Here we have him fulfilling perfectly everything about the red heifer. Let me run through it and get your question. Is that okay? Oh, I didn't have a question. Oh. Um, Nancy posted the other day, she was talking about this time in Jerusalem. It was equivalent to all of the people in all of San Bernardino County coming to Bloomington at the same time. <laughs> okay. They were going to get stable space. Someone, yes. <laughs> someone put out, they did the figuring, you know, by numbers, and they're saying it would be like all of San Bernardino County, every person living in San Bernardino County, taking a trip to Bloomington, the little city of Bloomington, and needing a place to stay in Bloomington. 
That's what it was like. That's why it was so jammed full that God had prepared the perfect place for the lamb to be born. And where was he laid? In a feeding trough. Why would he be laid in, in what holds food for the animals? Could it be because he was going to be the bread of life? He was going to feed the world by him, himself. Yeah, being, yeah, it all, it all, every detail. So this red heifer had to be completely without sin or defect. We saw that in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Let me give you another verse we didn't look at. I have to open my tablet again. John 8, 56. 46, sorry, I knew it was wrong. John 8, John 8 and verse 46. And in 8.46, we read there. I get all excited when I see how exact. You can't find one thing he didn't do that he had to do, one thing that he did do that he shouldn't have done. You can't, I mean, it only could be orchestrated by God and perfect, perfect, perfect. And if just eight of them, just eight prophecies have been fulfilled, the chance of one person doing that is 10 to the 17th power. There's 17 zeros after it. To go with a few more prophecies, you get 10 to the 31st power. Before you can get into the 20s or 30s in your prophecies and you've got 300, it's so astronomically impossible that that you have to go literally out of this space called Earth to, to give an example of what it's like. Amazing. I'll bring that out for you another time. Verse 46. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? That's not the verse that I was looking for. Okay. Oh, convicts me of sin. Yes, it is. What Yeshua was saying is, if I have sin, call me out on it. Show me, prove to me, where is their sin? Not one of them could give any answer because he had not sinned. They could not convict him of sin. Furthermore, we even know when they put him on trial a little later, they had to have people come and lie about him to convict him. It was not because they finally found fault in him that he went to the cross. He willingly gave his life. Okay? Not only he had to be completely without sin or defect, had to be sacrificed outside the camp. We saw that in Hebrews 13, 13. He made himself sin for us. We read that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. His sprinkling makes us clean. I don't think we did all these verses. Go with me real quickly to 1 Kepa, 1 Peter. And I've got to watch my time because I've got to bring you up to date or Anne will never forgive me. <laughs> And neither will I, because it's this part of what we need to look at. First Peter 1, come on tablet. There we go, it was slow. First Peter 1 and verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father of Jehovah God in heaven, who knows what's going to happen before it happens. Remember, he is seen into eternity future as if it's already happened. This one. By the sanctifying work, the purifying, separating work of the Spirit, of the Ruch HaKodesh, to obey Yeshua uh, Mashiach, Jesus Christ, be sprinkled with His blood. Okay, in obedience we need to go through His work of being separated and sprinkling us with His blood. That way we are cleansed. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Hebrews 12, 24, we looked at in Revelation 1, 5, okay? The water separation that his sacrifice created is by the means that makes us clean from the impurity of sin. I think we did hit on that, Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. I know we read that in Hebrews 10, 22. So every stipulation of this red heifer, he has fit, okay? Uh, let me tell you now, why is this so important? Why are rabbis struggling with it? What are they doing with it today? And why does it matter today? Okay? Well, first of all, before we can understand the relevance of the red heifer to today, and the fact that we need the red heifer in temple worship today, we have no temple today. So why does it mean anything to our religious people? And how are we going to relate to this also? Well, i got to take you just real quickly into a Jewish person's view who is looking at the Jewish scriptures and wanting to be a part of God's plan, okay? To the Jewish person, they recognize Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a city chosen by God. Okay, it's the place that the focal point, God put his attention there. It's why it's extremely important to the Jew today. 
It was the focal point for the Jewish people. It was the object of all their yearnings. They never had any other capital. Jerusalem was it, and Jerusalem has never been a capital for any other nation. Okay? There, there's a very unique status that this city holds for the people of Israel, and nothing else can parallel with it. Nothing else can come there. What made Yerushalayim this important, this critical, this focal point to the Jewish person? What did it? The holy temple stood in Jerusalem. And that's what gives Jerusalem its eternal meaning. It still inspires future hope. They're still trying to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem today. Not somewhere else, not in another location. It has to be in Jerusalem. That's the soul of the city. It was the conscience of the entire um, entire nation of Israel and eventually it will be the conscience of the entire earth because we'll see in the millennium all the nations have to come up to the temple to bring their their sacrifices and all. It will be the wonder of the world again and I say that because it was a wonder of the world back then. It will be the focal point of prayers for all mankind again as it was then. Three times a day, the religious Jewish people, this is your Orthodox, this is your Hasidic, they pray three times a day, may the Holy Temple be rebuilt speedily and in our day. And every time they recite that, they face east toward Yerushalayim. That's how important it is to them. They have never forgotten their temple. The last temple stood there for almost a thousand years. It's been gone now for almost 2,000 years. But during this time, the temple functioned as the heart of the Jewish people. If you don't have a heart, you're not alive. Okay? It was the center of life. It was everything that had value. It was the kingdom for them. It was the spirit of prophecy. The Sanhedrin, the, the highest council of the Jewish court system, the religious body, at the land of Israel that's calling out the rules and the regulations said that the temple is not just a magnificent building, which they said it was, but they said also it was a place where a person could meet his creator. Is that not interesting? Where a person could meet with his creator. It was the place that gave man the capacity to engage in direct, constant, and fulfilling relationship with his creator and it takes us all the way back to genesis it takes us to the beginning it takes us to the meaning of shabbat before we ever get to the exodus they were to remember god is their creator every week god said stop and remember this and have a relationship with me and this is what the temple represented to them it was their world's true spiritual center and it will be in the future it was where the, the relationship with their God would unfold. They bring in their, their sacrifices to him and he would bless them. And they would receive more for coming and, and being obedient. So the living memory for the Jewish people, it's, it's the way that they describe this, and I love it. This is the Temple Institute whose intent is to rebuild the third temple. I'll tell you about them in a moment, and I'll tell you about them in relation to the red heifer, and we'll be done. So give me a couple minutes over time, and we'll be done, okay? They say that the living memory of that dream, its renewal, and I quote, keeps the fires of the temple altar burning within the collective heart of the nation of Israel and the hearts of all who cherish your God and his message for humanity. See, they weren't and they aren't saying, this is just for us. This is just for the Jewish people. They're saying, no, this is the place that the temple had the altar. This is the place, the altar, where we can get right with our creator God. This is for our relationship with the God. And this is not just for the Jew, but for the whole world to get in right relationship with their God from this place. They don't know what they're saying. They're so close, and yet they're missing something here. Well, the Temple Institute leadership believes that it is the secret to the Jews' survival today is holding on to this dream and rebuilding this temple. And that when they're standing there again in place, chosen by their creator, then Israel again will become the focus and the energy 
to fulfill the divine purpose. In essence, what they're saying is what God said Israel was to be. Israel is to be a kingdom of priests that represents God to the nations. That's what they were to do. And in essence, the, the Temple Institute is saying, when we have our third temple, when it's standing again, when the focal point is here, when they're seeing that this is where you can be right with your creator, have that intimate relationship, and it's to be to, to, for the world. The role of the Holy Temple in the life of man is to enable him to realign himself with God and to get, dedicate himself wholly to God. Now you're beginning to see why this is so critically important and everything for their lives and the quality of their lives hinges on this. Now maybe you understand why they go to the degree that they are going to for the rebuilding. And it's very interesting. I didn't know this in time to share it in, in my Passover presentation. But if you remember when the matzah is broken and they eat a piece of the matzah with the bitter herbs and with the harosis, the sweet um, pasty stuff that reminded them of the mortar, when they would eat that as a sandwich on that Seder night, they say, and the rabbis are passing this down to the people, they say that they're remembering that this was done at, at a, um, in, in Bible times, it was done in the shadow of the temple. Well, that fits because remember, all the Jews had to come up to Jerusalem to keep the Pesach, to keep Passover. They weren't way back wherever, so in essence, they were eating it right under the shadow of the temple. So every year when they are eating this, they remind the people of the temple, the importance of the temple. We've got to get our temple again. We've got to rebuild our temple. Well... If they worked very hard and they put everything together and they have they have all the, the elements that need to go into use in the temple, they're not just museum pieces, they're real pieces that they will use in the temple. There's one more thing that they have to have to have that temple be able to function. And that is that they have to have the high priest functioning in his role. And how can the high priest function in his role? He has to be sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer. He has to go through the ceremonial mikvah, and then he is ready in purity to give the sacrifice for the nation, to, to, to do all the work that the high priest would do to make the people right with their God. So everything matters. Even if they have the temple and they have a, a beautiful building, and they have everything in place, if they don't have their high priest functioning, then it, it misses its, its whole point, its whole reason, and it's still lacking. Is Believing, the high priest uh, orthodox or messianic? Pam just asked a question I could do a whole class on. Is the high priest orthodox or messianic? The, according to the scriptures, the orthodox Jew today is the one who's trying to adhere to the scriptures. So they are orthodox in their beliefs, but the only one who can fulfill it to the degree that scripture declares it is the Messiah himself. Not just anyone who believes in Messiah, but the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, the great high priest, is none other than Messiah himself, who is called the, our great high priest. After the order of Melchizedek, my God is king. The one who declares is God is king, and that is Yeshua because we know that God is king and, and Yeshua is king of kings. So now he's declaring himself to be God, makes him high priest forever. Not for a year or for a few years till he dies, but forever. So the answer, I would say, has to go to the level of the Messiah, but the Orthodox are the ones looking for Messiah. They just don't realize who he is. So they say that we are still missing the single most important ingredient, that biblical purity that will be brought upon us by the ashes of the red heifer cleansing this one. And they would pick the high priest from the Levitical family, from the, the family of Aharon. We know from Aaron. Aaron was a high priest first. DNA has helped them. They can identify the Cohen marker. Cohen means priest, so they know they've got the right family. And they would be looking for the one who is to fulfill that position, but they'll be looking for a man. And a man can't do this. It, the man is not sinless right there. He also, once if he was sacrificed, then he'd be dead. But 
Our sacrifice raised from the dead. Our sacrifice is the greater. It's the better blood, the better sacrifice, the better temple, better everything. There's so, a yes or no. <laughs> there's not no yes or no. no. There's it not. Has a, to be the Messiah. It has to be the Messiah. It has to be the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. Not just Orthodox and not just a Messianic person. It has to be Messiah. Because uh, so, Jesus only. was a peer and, and man's not peer. Right, so, right. They have to be able to shed sinless blood. Only Messiah can do that. In the past, were they Orthodox? The, the high priest, yes. Yeah, yeah right. they would be what we consider the orthodox line That's today. What yes. The red heifer. Yes, yes, exactly. She's got it. She's got it. So, um, just before I get to you, Rowena, with your question, let me let me give this in case if somebody has to go and then we'll get your question. Don't let me forget you. I see you, okay? Um, they are st still trying to, to raise the red heifer in Israel. The last report was seven, eight months ago, and then they updated March 1st, 2021. I think you'll all agree with me, 30 days off, I've got the latest report here, okay? The, remember, the animal had to be in its prime, it had to be in its years of fertility, it had to be able to give life, so it has to be between two years, and some say four, some will even give it to a fifth year. But the closest that they got to qualifying has now been disqualified. The ones that they've been watching for two years, and it has to be at least two years old, so they're watching it from birth to make sure that there's no imperfections that show up, have now just been disqualified because the white hairs that were there all along that they were hoping would turn red did not. <laughs> but they have two more red heifers that they are now watching who are younger than the age needed. And at this point, they're considered 99.9% .9 red heifers. But they still see a couple white hairs in each one that are not kosher. So they've got the waiting game going. They've got to wait again until they get older. They have to wait. I don't know how young they are. I don't remember. Um, but basically, Temple Institute said on March 1st, we're no closer than we were a half a year ago. And we're still watching. But it, he says, have patience. What's your problem? We've been waiting almost 2,000 years. We can wait a little bit longer. <laughs> but again, they have to, to hit that, that decree. And now when I take it back to the question in the beginning, remember when they were told, you just have to obey this commandment whether you understand it or not. It's called chalk. But do we see an understanding and a fulfillment in Messiah? And no need for a red heifer because he is the red heifer. He is the one. He has been sacrificed. His, his blood, his, um, the water, the renewing, the refreshing has taken place. He will come back in that ruling role rather than sacrificial role. So... What are we waiting for? We who are believers in who the red heifer is and the picture, we are not waiting for this third temple. It will be a tribulation period temple. It will be desecrated by the Antichrist. That's right. We are looking forward to the temple that Hezekiel describes, chapters 40 on to the end of the book. This is the millennial temple. This is when Messiah will come back. He will rule and reign. He will show that he is the greater high priest forever. And they will have the completeness of this. So, don't have a cow. <laughs> don't get upset that they can't find the perfect. Realize man is always going to come short. The tribulation temple, should we see it starting to be rebuilt? Don't let that throw you. We could see it before we go home to heaven, and we may not see it before we go home to heaven. Doesn't matter whichever way. But I guarantee you what will be built during the tribulation will be desecrated. It will be trampled underfoot. But the Messiah will come. There will be a temple made larger than the, the, the temple has ever been. You read in, in, in the prophets and you will see how God reshapes the geography. It is that temple where Messiah comes back to rule and to reign. And guess what? You have better than a front row seat. 
you come back with him, you will be ruling and reigning with him. Those of you dying to see Israel, well, you'll be there <laughs> unless he sends you out on assignment somewhere else. So do we have a fulfillment? Is the red heifer a picture of Yeshua, the Messiah, the only one possible? Yes. yes. Unequivocally, yes. There is no other answer. Does it make sense on every single point? Even the fact that Messiah suffered outside the camp. The, the symbols in the, the temple and the tabernacle could not take away sin. They were pictures foreshadowing. The work had to be done outside of the camp. The work had to be done outside of anything this world has because it wasn't holy, it wasn't perfect. But our Son of God is, and He is able to fulfill it all perfectly. So every bit of the picture just says, Mashiach, 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 Messiah. That's the red heifer. Is that not an interesting study? The mysterious meaning of the red heifer? Mm -hmm. Messiah in his atoning work. Mm -hmm. Rowena, question. Uh, during the Old Testament times, when they're preparing for the ashes of the heifer, mm -hmm. That's only done once a year after the Purim? I didn't bring out what they do with the ashes. Thank you. I missed that somewhere in my notes. The, remember, they've had nine red heifers through the course of time. What they do with the ashes is they keep them in three different locations. Some are kept at the temple. Some were kept at the Mount of, of um, Olives, Olives where, where the sacrifice took place. And remember, I told you, too, by the way, they're up there outside the camp, they're outside of the tabernacle or the temple, but they had a perfect view of the Holy of Holies. They had a perfect view of the place, and they would sprinkle the blood out there. When the, when the leprous person wanted to be declared clean by the priest, they were taken outside of the camp to this location. That's where they would be sprinkled, where they'd go through the mikvah before they were allowed to come back into the camp. They had to go through all that, that cleaning outside of the camp. They keep some of the ashes... Uh, on that temple mount, they keep some of them at, I mean, on that mount where the sacrifices stand, they keep some of them with the, the temple, and then some of them were used. But they had three different locations. I forget the third right now. Um, oh, the temple third. Temple mount now outside the camp. Uh, yes, yes. And then um, I'll tell you the third in just a moment. But the, they were to be used to, again, cleanse the high priest once a year for the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the bulls and goats. Before he would do that, before the Day of Atonement sacrifice, Yom Kippur, he would be cleansed with the ashes from the red heifer. And the ashes, if, when they would be coming down to not having enough ashes left because they've been used to sprinkle the lepers, they've been used for the cleansing of the high priest, okay. when they would be needing another one before they would run out of the ashes, they would sacrifice another red heifer. So oh, okay. that's what they've done. They believe that somewhere there are some ashes from the last one. Nobody knows where. And if that's important in God's book, they'll find them the same way I believe that they found the Ark of the Covenant. But whether that's necessary or not, or whether they'll just start with the new because they'll have the new, they, be, before they can make that temple um, active, which will be in the tribulation, in the first half is active because in the middle of the tribulation, the sacrifices are stopped, which means they're going on. You can't stop something that hasn't started. So within that first three and a half years of the tribulation period, they will have found a red heifer and been able to cleanse a high priest to be making sacrifices there. That's how close we are. Why it's exciting to us we see fulfillment of God's word. We get excited over the red heifer for the picture it is. But when you see all these things coming so close, they have found the color for the blue that had it been in the garments. It's from a snail that, that's very hard to find. They found it. They have enough of the blue that they've made the high priest's garments with the blue in it, according to the scriptures. They have all the, the paraphernalia. I don't like that word. But all the implements that have to be used have been made. They, they're made out of gold, they're made out of silver, very expensive, took time to all of this to the point that the Temple Institute has a complete place that you tour through now. They've developed it very well in the last 25 years when we saw it in its early days to today. It is so much more ready and everything is ready to go right into Temple worship. When you see all of that and then you hear that they're on the edge of finding... 
can you get rid of my echo, Roger? When you find that they're, they're that close to finding the ashes that will be considered pure, maybe these two that are coming up, maybe those white hairs will turn red. I don't know. I kind of doubt it because I think it starts from the follicle and grows out, but then there'll be other red heifers, you know, that they are raising that they're looking for those, those two or the one. They only need one. So that when they're watching two, they've got a backup already ready. Babies are changes. Okay, baby's hair changes. Okay, yeah, my mom started out uh, blonde and fell out and grew back in darker. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. So they okay. have two red heifers now. Yes, that they are but watching again. The two they've been watching that you've been hearing about in the last almost two years have now been disqualified. They're the right they've age, but they're not. They've been disqualified. Two. March 1st, both of them were disqualified. They were. They were disqualified. Yeah. But they've already got two that they're watching that aren't old enough they yet. Disqualified. I just so what do they that. do with those who are disqualified? They still put them up for food or what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They might be milking them for milk because <laughs> they're female. I don't know what they're doing with them. I, I do not remember. Um, I'm looking for the third place where they... Um, I may have to bring that back next week, which I'll put it, I'll tack it onto this before we put this up on the internet, um, because I'm not seeing it fast, I'm, I'm sure I'm looking over it, and I'm sure I'm just brain dead not to be able to tell you, but, um, okay, well, I'm still looking, and I've gone through, I know that they had them in three locations, maybe I can just, um, Google somebody, the three locations, for the ashes of the red heifer and see if a quick answer pops up while that's happening. Rhonda, your question? Um, I may have missed it, but the scriptures that I wrote down, I didn't see the word red. Did I miss it? Which scripture has the word red for red heifer? The red is a picture of the blood. I don't know that we have red, um, but here's what I would say that comes pops into my mind right away. Um, the word Adam, Adam, comes off of Adama, which is red. So in essence, when Adam was called Adam, he was being called man, but he really more from the Hebrew root was being called red. The same way we even know that Esau came out red, you know, and and yeah. God, you know, uh, um, he was, uh, it comes off of that too, the, the word from there. I don't want to get confused or get too far out. But when we see that, that man, had that distinction, I'll put it that way. Then we see Yeshua, God, enter into the human race, become a man, so that he becomes red, so that he can save man. Because remember the kinsman redeemer had to be of the family. They had to be of the same, you know, they had to be of the family, had to be human to redeem humans. He had to be willing and he had to be able to take on whatever financial responsibility, whatever it was, and Yeshua was every bit the kinsman redeemer. So in that same way, we see he had to be red, he had to be man. He had to be the second Adam. So I think that's where the color comes in. Um, and then red represents for us the blood that would be shed. So the, and it's, and it's a so the Jewish people never looking for the red, the Jewish people that are looking for this red heifer. Oh, where in scripture does it say it has to be a red heifer? Numbers 19. Numbers 19. says red heifer. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were looking for the symbolic fulfillment. Yes, Numbers 19, and Rowena tells us specifically verse 2. Um, and I'll read that for you. Yes, I'm sorry. I must have, when I read later in, in Numbers, I should have read verse 2 for you also. Okay, verse 2. This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel that they bring you an unblemished red heifer in which okay. there is no defect and on which a yoke has never been mounted. Okay, the yoke not only means they've never done anything profane, which is a picture of Messiah's sinless life, but also um, when the yoke hadn't been put on them, that would be because they're of that fertility. They're not going to yoke a, a fertile cow. They're going to yoke ones that aren't going to be giving birth. You know, so it, it was showing able to reproduce also. Um, it's also said that, that the only yoke the Lord had on him was from God, not from man. 
so and he chose to come under the yoke of the the wage of sin which is death okay thank you um rowena i didn't realize where i had missed with Rhonda, so i'm glad we got that on track that's where we know it has to be a red heifer and it's the only sacrifice in scripture where it ever calls out the color doesn't you know he, your lambs had to be pure blemish free but it could be a white a, yeah, a brown a color. black a spotted yeah. they just had to be free from defect but the heifer had to be the red heifer and again the only time it's female again why the female because the female is producing life the messiah was going to produce life out of his death okay have i dotted my eyes and crossed my t's now <laughs> i am so glad you caught that Rhonda. that was critical and rowena thank you for popping in because i went off on the symbolism and you know i've i've been involved with um, evangelism with the Jewish people for quite a while. And this is the first that I've heard of this. I wondered, have you seen this used as, as a really powerful testament to the Messiah? And in, in, have you seen it used in witnessing? Is there any mini publication, you know, similar to kind of like the Four Spiritual Laws-ish, where the, the Jewish people, even the Orthodox, could see the poignant, obvious uh, uh, illustration of Messiah that this is? This, I mean, I, I, where has it been all these years? It's there. It's the same way like we present Messiah in the Passover. There are those who have presented the, the Red Heifer, I believe, in some of the other ministries. There are notes that, that are out there definitely from Messianic believers that if they would read what, what has been printed, it's telling that, it's showing it. But they have to be open to receive it. Otherwise, the, their eyes are blinded to the truth that's right before them. How do they go through the Pesach, the Seder? How do they go through it year after year after year after year and not see that it's a picture of the Messiah? When that crescendo hits the Lamb of God, and he's called that in scripture. When we, you see it from the matzah broken, Barry brought out the one who brings it out gets a, a gift. The one who finds Messiah gets the gift of eternal life. When you see it in the candles that are lit, that it's showing that it's standing for God and it's standing for the triune God. And the part that comes out visible is the middle part where God is three. You don't see the Father. You don't see the Spirit. You know they're there. But it's that middle part that comes out and becomes visible. If that doesn't shout to you, that's the part of God that became visible. When did God become visible? Only in Messiah. These are so clear. How do they miss it? How do they miss the blood on the doorpost? I mean, he, God doesn't just give it one time and one picture. He gives this picture. And this is like looking at a diamond. And every single facet, every color is telling you something else about that diamond. But it's all one diamond. It's all, all there. The red heifer is another angle of that diamond, looking at that diamond. And yet, if they will not honestly look at the scriptures, look at it, see, how do we prove to them that Messiah, that, that Yeshua Jesus fulfilled the Messianic prophecies? We have to show them the scriptures. Okay, Micha says they had to be born in Bethlehem. Those who want to say Rabbi Schneerson in the 90s who died who's still going to come back from the dead, is the Messiah. Was he born in Bethlehem? And the answer is no, he was born in New York. Well, I'm sorry, folks, but New York is New York. And you may love New York, but it's not Beit Lechem, and it's not in Israel. Rabbi Schneerson didn't have a chance from the moment he was born to be the Messiah. But they'll look at him and say he is, and his followers even were waiting for him to resurrect from the dead, which they want to deny the resurrection of the one who is Messiah. And here they want to accept him, and they're still waiting some 20 years later. There are still followers. You can go into the extreme Orthodox um, synagogues, and I've been in some of them. I've seen it. They've got the picture of Rabbi Schneerson on the wall. He is their revered rabbi. The way I taught you about Maimonides, they're talking about Schneerson. And they were devastated when he died. They wanted him to be so comfortable when he came back that they recreated the place that he lived in 
from New York, and they put it in Israel because they know he's going to come to Israel. So they made a duplicate of his home so he'd be happy, he'd be comfortable. They, they have a setting for El Yahu, for Elijah, at the Passover. And they know he has to come first because they don't understand that Yochanan John fulfilled the spirit of Elijah, did what Elijah was said. So they make his place fancy. They make his seat fancy. They're ready for him. And then when one comes who's in that spirit who fulfilled, oh, no, you're not him. You know, they will tell you, those who, who you argue with about, is Jesus the Messiah? Well, if he was the Messiah, then he failed miserably because where is his kingdom? He didn't do what Messiah is supposed to do. He didn't break the, the bondage of Rome. He didn't break anything. Our people are still not in the position they're supposed to be in. So if Yeshua is supposed to be the Messiah, he failed miserably. He didn't fulfill his duty. Well, hello. What happens to Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and so many other places where this Messiah had to deal with sin, had to come as a sin offering, he had to be crucified. All of these verses had to be fulfilled. And if Yeshua did them, fulfilled every single one, is it not likely that we have a Messiah who's coming again, who's going to fulfill every single verse for that second coming? He will set up that kingdom. He will set Israel up. They will be the head nation. They will have their promises fulfilled. The nations around them will know the Lord is God. And they will plant and not be uprooted. They will get to eat from their crops. They will get to live in their land. And they'll live in a thousand years of shalom. The world has never known that. But this one who came first will fulfill what he is to fulfill. But it's either two messiahs or it's one messiah who comes twice. And we know what the answer is. If he nailed it, and that's a good word to use because it included nailing, piercing, it, all the way through. The apocomen, oh my goodness, striped, bruised, pierced, broken, buried, brought out, eternal life. All there. How did they miss it? The veil of blindness. So, yes, is, is there a teaching out there that says, hey, the red heifer is a picture of our Messiah? The Passover is a picture of Messiah? Yes, they're out there. Do we teach it? Yes, we do. Would I welcome the rabbinical people to come sit and listen and argue with the Word of God? Yes, I would. Not because I have any authority and not because I'm capable to take them on, but the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit is. And it's the Word of God that is true. And if you can find one mistake in the Word of God anywhere from Bereshit to Revelation, then I'm throwing the whole thing out. Because if there's one mistake, there can be more. And who's to say, oh, well, then this part's good and that part isn't? Well, prophecy proves to me how accurate the Word of God is. When, when it, every time it goes out on prophecy and how much of our scriptures are prophetic and it always gets it right always the history proves it in Daniel's day when he described and it was so exact they said oh it's got to be that he wrote after he didn't live when he did then they find proof that he did live when he said and you've got Yeshua himself saying he wasn't a historian he was a prophet he foretold. How did he know that war in detail? Well, how does Yochanan know what's going to happen in the tribulation? And if they would even take that, if they found themselves living in tribulation days, Revelation lays out, they can know exactly what the Antichrist is going to do next. They can know and prepare for what they see coming. They've got the whole roadmap. They could know if, well, hey, you know what? It's a seven-year period, and we know it started at this time. So Messiah's going to come back. Seven years from them. They can know everything. It's right there for them, and not one word will fail. It will all be there. Sorry, Pam. Shalom. Lord bless you. Yeah, I got a lady picking me up for Bible study. And, and I know we're running over, but it's your questions. I really did finish the whole study. You got the whole red heifer. But, but you see my enthusiasm and my um, passion for it because it is so accurate. My dad used to stand in front of groups and he would say, Prove me. The Bible is wrong, and I'll pay you $100,000. He didn't have 100000 in the bank, but he could say it because he knew they couldn't prove the Word of God wrong. You give science, you give history, you give archaeology, you give whosoever in that time, and they prove the Bible right every time. I love it. I love, I'll stake my life on it. And what, what 
The truth of it is, I have. And I don't just mean my livelihood, but I mean my eternal future. I am so sure that I've opened my heart to my Messiah and said, yes, I accept your sinless blood in my place so that I'm guaranteed heaven one day. And I don't have one shred of fear that I'm wrong because it's perfect. It's the perfect fit. It was made to measure like a glove. And if you don't know that's from Fiddler, that's from Fiddler. <laughs> but I just have one quick question. I, um, you, you, uh, and you hope your teacher book. has a quick answer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, isn't there an oil that is un, that cannot be made again because it was made from certain uh, olives that are no longer extant, but the, uh, if one flask has been discovered of an oil that uh, was used... For the consecrating that, of the... the the Simple. priests and kings. There's something rattling around in my head, something, but I, I don't have the exacting facts like what you're saying. I can go research. Oh, no, don't. I just, it, uh, it's just uh It's a curiosity. curiosity, yeah. But that blue is amazing. You know, they, they, they thought that the snail that excretes this color of blue was extinct, and then they found a few, and they've been able to produce enough of them, you know, help them live, that... Now they've got enough of the blue. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Good I to see you. Missed you. Excuse me. Sorry. Somebody's know. leaving. Well, we're way over. The phone. I saw oh, had it on I saw you trying. I saw you trying. <laughs> and if you were on the airplane, it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but I did put it on. Coming no. in. I hope to. Good. Yeah. Lord bless you. You good? You doing good? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, we need to talk soon. <laughs> Shalom, ma'am. Sorry. I, I haven't oh, seen her in ages. How much I appreciated what you were saying. And uh, it every sentence was full of meaning. And right, you know, you nailed it, as you were saying. The Word of God nailed it. And, and I God. thank you, but yes. And, and I do, I want to say to my rabbis who are... You know, what does this mean? And what are we going to do about it? How do we get it? You know, give us a chance. Let us present to you. See if it makes sense to you. Find what's wrong with it. Point it out to us. You know, we're not afraid for you to scrutinize it. But it just might be the answer you're waiting for. We had a dear, dear friend in missionary work also, um, Israeli, lived in San Diego. She's long been with the Lord. She had opportunity to sit with Menachem Begin when he was in his prime ministership. And he was very tender toward the scriptures, very tender. So he was asking her questions, she was answering, and it came right down to the point that she was bringing out, it's either one Messiah twice or one that's come before. And he said to her, well, you know we're waiting for the Messiah to come. And she said, and what will you do when you find out he was here before? And he didn't say a word. He had no answer. So, you know, it's there. Just pray for the veil blindness to be removed. Pray for the stubbornness of the heart to open and, and receive it. Because there's that pride factor. If he is who he says he is, then I have to be obedient to him. I have to keep his commandments. I have to have him as my head. I want to be. I want to be the one that, that's in control of my life. I don't want someone else. But you couldn't have someone more loving and more caring. He gave his life for you. Why isn't he going to lead you into all that is good for you? So let's pray. We didn't close in prayer. Loretta's trying to leave too. Let me close this in prayer two seconds, and then we can keep going. You know, those who want to stand Zoom, we'll open it all up. Roger uh, muted a couple minutes ago again because of the feedback. So, Lord God. How exciting, how exhilarating to see you in the fullness of the pictures that you've put down for us. Lord, thank you that a picture is worth a thousand words and that in it we can see in detail the accuracy and the truth of the word of God who is alive and powerful and wanting to be in our lives. Lord, we do pray for our Jewish brethren. We pray for all people to hear and to see and to understand you are who you claim to be. You are very God himself. You are our Savior. You are our Messiah. You are Son of God. You are King of Kings. 
and Lord of Lords. We praise you and we thank you and we pray, especially at the season of Passover, of Resurrection Day, of all that's going out, Lord, may eyes be open, ears unstopped, hearts tender. May the word of God be received and may it find root in, in their very beings that it might produce eternal life for them too. And we praise you for those of us who have it. Oh Lord, thank you. And thank you. It is forever. In your precious and holy name. Amen.